Um, so we are the reason that you are, uh, we've pulled you away from the coffee and dessert, but we have a very interesting panel ready for you. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to everyone here at the auditorium today. And for those who are joining virtually, thank you for joining us for this very important session on mapping danger and the use of data to create safe public spaces and transportation systems. My name is Iman Abubakar, and I'm the Urban Mobility Project Manager for the World Resource Institute in Africa. Um, it says India on the thing, but <laughs> Africa. <laughs> um, so, uh, just a little bit of what brings me here today. So many, like many of you, I've been working on uh, the space of safety, equity, and integration of mobility systems and using gender data to unlock the potential of trans transformation for African cities has been a big part of what I do. Um, so this is a topic that's very close and dear to my heart. Um, before we get started and I bring on uh, remarkable panelists, I just wanted to engage and get a little bit and hear from the audience a little bit um, as I was preparing for the panel, I asked myself three questions, which I sort of want to ask the audience, um, and including the panelists. So how many of you have been on a panel or sat in an audience talking about gender, data, and um, transport? Just generally. Okay. <laughs> okay, great. Um, how many of you feel that we've advanced in addressing gender issues in transportation? Okay. So we have a lot, a lot of, um, of inspiring that we need to do. Um, and then if you could just, you know, as you think about this, just make note of sort of what's holding us back from reaching our goal. Um, what is it that we need to do? And we'll love to hear from the audience as well um, and interact with you as we go along. So the reason I ask these questions is because in the next hour, we want to make the session as interesting and as beneficial as possible. Um, so we'll spend the next hour exploring how the gender data gap in mobility is affecting safety, accessibility, and sustainability of our transportation systems and our public spaces. Um, we want this session to dig a bit deeper, to understand some of the root causes, to leave you with tangible sort of um, things that you can do when you walk out of this, this conference room. Uh, we want to provide concrete examples from not just one region, but many regions across the world. And more importantly, we really want um, to shed light on what have been the successes and what have been the pain points and lessons learned along the way. So all this in an hour, you may ask. <laughs> um, it would have been a difficult task, but we have a great set of panelists that I'd like to introduce to join me on stage. Um, and I'll introduce them as they walk on, onto the stage, and I will also give you a chance to talk a little bit about why you're here. So without further ado, uh, let me introduce the remarkable women on this panel. My short introduction won't do each of them any justice at all. Um, so first, Ms. Uh, Bronwyn Thornton, who is the CEO of Walk21 Foundation, which is a global network leading the movement for walkable cities. Uh, Bronwyn works with local communities and global partners to make cities more walkable and with that more sustainable, equitable, and livable. We also have Kalpana Viswanath, who is the CEO and founder of Safety Pin, a social enterprise using data and technology to support cities to become safer, more inclusive, and smarter. And we have Angie Palacios, who's the principal executive in the gender and urban mobility sector at the Development Bank of Latin America. Uh, please give a warm applause for our panelists. So um, we're just going to start with maybe getting to know you all a little bit more. Um, and if you can tell us a little, introduce yourselves a little bit um, why you're on this panel, uh, and we'll take it from there. So Ronwin, could we start with you? OK. Just to clarify, is this my full impulse talk or just the introduction? Uh, you can do the introduction. Okay. I've not done an impulse talk before. I'm quite. <laughs> I'm quite excited. I, I quite like taking the pulse of the room as well. I feel like there's quite a lot of expertise here. Yeah, I'm Bronwyn. I know some of you. I'm the chief exec at Walk21. Um, it's not an acronym. We do what it says on the tin. We promote walking. We work with communities around the world um, to do that. So I wanted to actually, uh, as Kalpana did this morning, reflect on this meeting as a starting point for, for what I wanted to say. 
because um, I was one of the first, uh, I was here at the first Women Mobilise Women um, meeting uh, five years ago. And it was an actually an extraordinary day. I was, I was reflecting with Daniel Moser in one of the breaks how um, so my colleague from Walk 21 was in the Sum For All meeting down the, down the hall. And no reflection on Sum For All, but it was losing big time because the sounds of joy and laughter and engagement that just kept peeling out of this room and echoing down the corridors of this building. And everybody in that meeting was sitting there going, oh, they're having all the fun. It really was a palpable, palpable experience. And uh, it really was different. The energy in the room was different and a real sense of change was afoot. And there are many more men here than there were that day. In fact, you could count on one hand the number of men that were in that room. And there were none on stage, that was the rule. I think only Daniel had a moment to actually, actually speak. And there's two reflections I wanted to share particularly about that. One as a woman and one with the, one of the few men in the room. And the man in the room who was there, and he's a very good man as well, he said he felt distinctly uncomfortable in the space because he was the distinct different person in that space. And that's how I felt for most of my career as a woman in the transport sector. A distinctly different person in, in the space. Now he wasn't intimidated, he wasn't threatened by it, but he was mildly intimidated by it, and he's not a man who's intimidated easily. And, but that's how women feel in a male dynamic, which is what informs most of our transport systems and our built form and the social contract under which we live in so many of our communities. And the second feeling was my own feeling of not being the woman in the room anymore. The token woman, the young woman, anything, any version of woman, but I was the woman in a transport sector. I'm showing my age a little bit here. But that feeling of relief, of feeling that surge of women coming through and into the sector was very real for me. And, and, it, made, and, and, the, and it made me again feel that when there is more women in the space, women can feel more relaxed and feel more comfortable. And to me, this translates, that sensation translated directly, because you spoke about it, it, I recalled it so clearly. It translates to how we feel in public space. That's how that, that feeling of walking and using our systems is, is reflected in that same feeling of comfort or discomfort we have in, in those different dynamics. Because we know women and men move differently, it's very clear the mobility needs of men and women are very different. We've understood that now, it's well documented. I'm not gonna go through them because if you, the experts all put your hands up already, but we know about women and trip chaining and um, the sense of fear that women and gender minorities face. But also particularly that women often spend longer traveling and pay more because of the nature of their trips and their mobility is, limited mobility directly links to economic opportunities. As a result of this, Interestingly enough, women place different values on the infrastructure that they want from their transport systems. So in Europe, the data shows that women value public transport, pavements, streets, and parks highly, and they value them more than men. So I'm, I'm clarifying the gender differences here, but this is what we actually now know. This is the data that we now need to understand what, what we've been hearing from the different women in, in the room. And then, but sadly, women suffer in these spaces that they want, the things that they want. Everywhere in the world it's been studied. But the thing I really want to put stress today as well is that women are not a homogenous group. Just as you can look around this panel and around this room, women are all different. It's very easy. The experiences that women have varied based on age. Young and older women experience public space and experience harassment differently. Just as men and women uh, define harassment differently, so too do different women experience it differently. And they experience it differently from night to day and within different cultures. And so that, that sort of empowerment that we come from being together must never overshadow the, the importance of those uh, the differences as well. And what we are talking mostly about today is about the apps and the data, the granular data that we can find on our streets and from women about their experience in, in space. And what's, what the research that we did as part of the Inclusify project showed that women use route planning apps. They like them. They have more take up than men for, um, to use technology to, to choose to walk. Around 40% of both men and women agree that technology makes walking easier. 
But this is mostly as a navigation aid and mostly in relation to root choice. But when it comes to root choice, we know, and Kalpana's work shows this and the work that um, I'm going to share from us, root choice is critical for women. And I have had an interesting phone call from a radio station in the UK recently where they wanted to do an article about the Wear app, which is the one that we have, which is similar to Safety Pin. Um, because she, was, she wants to travel and she wants those apps to help her make her choice to travel as a single woman and to, to use that. So apps are important, the data that we can gather from those women, but we, what we find out there is root choice apps, harassment maps, audit apps. There's over 16 systems out there for women to um, share their experiences. And there's 27 different measures. That's 27 different ways women suffer in public space that they can report through their, their different systems. So there's a lot of opportunities out there, but what we are always interested in at Walk 21 is what impact is that having? How are we having an impact? And I'm sure we'll hear about that from my, my two colleagues on, on the panel. But most systems focus on providing the opportunity for women to report incidences of safety and security, to share with each other or to inform the local authority. And these create maps of fear. Now cities don't want maps of fear. Cities want to invite people. Cities want their citizens to feel happy and to, to, to feel safe. But this fear drives women away from the streets and into motorised transport, so we must address that if we want to support the climate agenda, which, as walkability people, we do. And so just finally with the Wear Hair app, and I'm going to finish here, is we, it was started as... Um, uh, a venture capital, you know, so uh, an enterprise. She wanted to create this app to support the women in cities across Italy. This is a woman called Eleonora. And she started in 2017 with a pilot in Turin. And it grew through all the um, Italian universities, mostly those, uh, Italian cities, mostly those with universities. They have 23 cities with over 85,000 users reporting their walking experiences on a regular basis. And she thought she was generating such fantastic data that the local authorities would buy it from her to inform their decision making so they could make those streets safer for women and therefore respond to those maps of fear by making it better but they didn't. And so she was left as in an enterprise situation, not being able to turn a profit on, on, on that investment. And then that's why she approached us and said, look, I've got this community, they call them warriors, you know, because they share information about their experiences. You've got a commitment to, to campaign for walkability. Can we come together and, and do something about that and try and leverage the data that we have to make a difference for women? Because there's no point having lots of information if we don't use it to make a difference. And so that's what we're doing with them now with the Step Up project. We're using our walkability app, which has street harassment as a factor, but not the focus. It's the full spectrum of walkability dimensions for people on the streets. And we're doing a project for this year looking at where we've mapped the fear that women experience in the cities of Italy. And we're mapping those environmental walkability elements. And then we're taking that as a package to the local authority to leverage change. And with Walk 21, with our app, we always go in with local authority engagement so that they invest and return to the community the effort that they've put in to actually report their data. It requires both. We need the political leverage, we need the community to contribute, and we need the technology to, to, help, us, to help us bring that together. And just to come to a close, I just want to address one more thing about women and moving in public space. It's not just about safety and security. Yes, we must do that, but we must use the information that we gather to do cost convenience and comfort as well, so that we go beyond maps of fear to not only address safety, but to realize a fully woman-centered community and transport system for our women and girls into the future. Thank you, thank you so much for, for setting the scene for us. Um, and I think it's, you know, earlier in the, in the sessions, we were talking a lot about how we can quantify some of the data sets of around perceptions, around feeling of safety. So tools like Walk 21 um, and what Safety Pin is doing is trying to bring these data sets to the forefront. Um, so, uh, Kalpana, do you want to tell us a little bit more about Safety Pin and how it's helping bridge the gender data gap and sort of the insights from different regions? Um, good afternoon. Sure, everyone's very tired. <laughs> it's been a very intense day of conversations. Um, so, um, Safety Pin is um, 10 years old this year. 
And we began with an app which was initially a crowd, for crowdsourcing data uh, using the tool of the safety audit. The safety audit is, um, is a very simple set of parameters uh, that we use to measure uh, how women or how anybody who's using a public space feels. And it has um, a combination of elements which is the physical infrastructure, so it is your walkability and the lighting, etc., the availability of public transport, but also <clears throat> the social usage of the space and the nature of um, uh, the built environment. So are there people using the space? Are there good eyes on the street? Um, so we started, um, uh, you know, like uh, Bronwyn says, we started date collecting data and we thought, you know, wow, everybody's gonna start giving us lots and lots of data, which didn't happen that easily. Um, Everyone who's ever worked uh, on an app will realize it's much easier to build an app than to get people to use it. <laughs> so um, we uh, have had to innovate over the years. To We recognize that um, crowdsourced data is valuable, but um, limited in scope in some ways. And I'll tell you why, because we and when we went to the um, at that time, we started doing some work in Delhi, the city that I'm from. And when we went to the government and said, see, we have this, like we have 12,000 12, women have told you where they feel unsafe. And they said, um, how can we trust them? You know, people can say whatever they want on app. I mean, they were not saying anything about women, but they're just saying that, you know, crowdsourced data um, is not necessarily a, um, trustworthy unless it's in millions, you know, when you have really, you know, like a trip advisor or something, then you would look at that. But then they also t told us another more important point. There were two other points. One was that, okay, in, you have a lot of red points. So in the safety pin uh, app, when you do an audit, if depending on the score, it's either red, orange, or green. So we said, oh, we look at all the red points, they're not safe. And they said, but where there is no point, what does that mean? And we realized that's another um, limitation of just crowdsourced data because it could mean two things. It could mean that you know people who live there don't have smartphones, don't have the time to do a safety audit. It could also mean, which is very likely, that women felt unsafe and therefore did not linger to do a safety audit, take out their phone, but really actually run as fast as they could, walk past that place. So. What I'm trying to say is that, you know, the lessons about data is also something we've learned over the years. So we then supplemented our initial data set, which was really just um, crowdsourced audits, which we continue to do. The app is still available, it's evolved, that'd be the thing. But we then, um, very soon, about two years later, we devised another methodology, which we call Safety Pin Night, which is a methodology through which we actually gather images of the entire street network, and then we analyze them. So what happens is you at least you get a base data for the entire city. So that when you're looking at it, you don't have big gaps of no data. So that, because what is the point of data? We're saying that you need data to prioritize resources, right? To prioritize, to, to build policies to make a difference. If your data set itself is incomplete, then it's difficult to advocate for certain kinds of change. So we then came up with the entire um, street data set, and we've done that in many cities, including in Bogota, in, in Delhi, in cities around the world, actually, we've worked. Uh, and that data set um, did, did help, because, for example, in Delhi, uh, I will tell you that we had um, uh, identified, we had mapped about 50,000 points of the city across 4,000 kilometers, Delhi's a big city. And we'd identified nearly 7,500 points of the city where there was zero light. There was absolutely no light, which meant no ambient light, not just street light, but absolutely no light from a shop. So it was really a, a dark spot in the city. And when we were able to put it on a map and show that there's 7,500 places, that data spoke. It sort of shocked the the, the, the authorities to say, okay, we'll do something about this. And they actually formed a multi-stakeholder committee and fixed a lot of the lights and came back to us two years later and said, can you map the city again? Because, you know, the, 
the, the, the sort of the chief secretary said, all these departments said that they have fixed it. We don't believe it. So they asked us to actually map the city as an independent um, uh, this thing, and we found that of the original 7,500, it had come down to 2,700. We did map more areas and find more dark spots, yeah. But the point is, it had it came down by nearly 65 percent, which is a lot. And and that was uh, and then we went to the places and collected data because we also realized, and I think that's the important thing. You need numbers, but you also need the feel of that data. What did that mean? So then we went to at least I think almost 25 of those places and spoke to women street vendors, others who use that area to say, did you find it was a difference? Did you notice it? And, and I will be honest, in some places I said, oh, I didn't even realize <laughs> it wasn't working and now it's fixed. And in some places, yes, they did say it was, it made a difference. So I think even how you measure the impact of um, the, the, what the data can say is important, you know. And um, finally, we've come up with a in the last few years ago, we came up with a third tool for data collection because what we found again with these two was that there was still something that was missing. We were missing a particular granularity that is needed to give recommendations for change, you know? Like, so we came up with a third tool called Safety Pin Sight, which is really, a, it's a, like a web-based app through which you can ask questions, but also take photographs and geotag the place. So what we do a lot of this, for example, uh, and we've done this with uh, Angie as well, is that, say, for example, we're doing a study of metro stations. So at a metro station, we use that tool through which we map at every in uh, entrance and exit, we map all the infrastructure, we map the services, so are there public toilets, are there security guards, but then we also speak to people. Right, and then we take photographs. So you have, like in one place, you have the geolocation. So it could be at a metro station, at this exit, it's actually much safer than another exit, you know? And I think that kind of granularity then, we have found that that is the data set, data set that we are really able to work with transport departments and transport planning in the city, because we're giving them very concrete data to say what you can do and how you can change it. So I think, uh, you know, I, I will st stop after this and we can, in the next round I can explain a little bit more about the other cities, but I think the point is that, you know, we also have to recognize that, you know, it, it's, it's not, there's not one data set which is going to change the world, you know. We have to keep evolving, we have to find ways of doing correlations with other data sets. One of the things we found which has really been positive for us, for example, in Bogota, in Durban where we're working now, they have integrated our data into their dashboard. So what that does is that the, they can look at our data in correlation to many other things. Because a lot of data is not public data. For example, in many countries, geolocated crime data is not public data. So for example, in, in India, it's not. So we cannot do the correlation between safety pin and the crime, but if they take it and they own it, then they can do the correlation and come up with more policies or changes. So I think also recognizing that only open data makes sense. That it's absolutely no sense in trying to own your data <laughs> because you're not gonna be able to bring about change. So, you know, the data is the new oil, the new gold, the new money, whatever, but it's not, it's not money, it's, it's valuable only if it can be used and it can be correlated and it's out there for people to do something with. Thank you, Thank you so much. And it, it brings me joy to hear that about open data and open tools because I think there's a lot of resources that are being wasted um, with this data being kept uh, and, and not being shared. And I think you've um, really touched upon a lot of the, the challenges and um, how these tools are helping to shed light, literally, <laughs> with the uptake of the data with government. Um, so maybe now uh, we can come to Angie to tell us a little bit about how this even gets more complex when we go into informal settlements and what's being done um, in the case study that you'll share with us. Sure. Um, well, hi, everybody. Um, just want to say I'm really excited. It's like it feels like an alumni reunion of some sorts. It's like my own 50 year anniversary from the first time I was here. So I'm happy to see familiar faces and new ones. Um, 
Yeah, so going going on the same line as, as Calpana on that granularity, we uh, we had worked in Bogota with Safety Pin. We mapped out 17,000 kilometers. So the entire city of Bogota is mapped out with Safety Pin. That information is out there. You can look at it in the, in, in the um, government websites. Um, 600 kilometers of bike lanes, I think, were mapped out. I mean, it was it was great. So we understood that the 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 tool worked, um, gave, gave really valuable insight to cities to use them in their um, in their land use planning and in, in other um, instruments for urban planning in the cities. And so we decided to, or the the city of Buenos Aires actually was interested in taking this tool and understanding how the accessibility of what we call popular settlements, I understand this doesn't translate well, they're usually informal settlements, but we don't like to use the word informal as it has negative connotations, but um, we went to eight informal settlements or popular settlements and tried to understand how was the access or the integration of the of these neighborhoods with the formal or the rest of the city, and particularly for women. There's a lot of studies that have been done in these particular neighborhoods where we know that women do not leave those neighborhoods because of fear, lack of transport, lack of accessibility. Um, they stayed within the neighborhoods. Sometimes they're they're huge, they're big in 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 in, in size terms and in density, and they are not able to. Um, take that employment opportunity in the formal city because of accessibility issues. And at the same time, there was a big push by the state, by the city and by the, the state, uh, the country in general, to intervene these neighborhoods, open up streets, uh, give infrastructure, basic infrastructure, sidewalks, streets, um, put public transport stops, so integrate or bring the system to the, to the, to the neighborhoods. And so we thought it was a really good time to measure how was that perimeter of, of accessibility within the neighborhood um, and see if these interventions were actually working or not or what else can be done. And we went with safety pin. We, you know, good thing and thank God you explained the methodology because I wouldn't have explained it as well. We mapped out all those variables. We actually used two out of your three instruments or tools because we use safety pin site as well to do um, the transport bus stop safety audits, we did interception surveys, um, and we decided to go beyond the safety pin tools and we also did participatory mapping. So with the old school social sciences way of sitting down with a lot of women, diverse women, uh, representing uh, many different socioeconomic and, and, and variables and contexts, and mapped out their daily routines to understand, again, from the or the built environment perspective, what was going on. And the interesting thing is that many of the indicators or the safety, the, the security perception index, as we call it, as safety pin calls it, they came out really well. So they were green or orange. Uh, because the city, the streets were intervened. They were nice sidewalks. There were, you know, human scale lighting. Everything by the book that the city was supposed to do, they did. But in the participatory mapping, we found discrepancies between the results. And so, even though the sidewalk was nice, there was a kiosk, you know, open laid. There was lighting. Women were still targeted particularly in where they went to uh, receive some kind of social service. So schools or vaccination uh, centers, women were targeted by uh, just crime in general. Um, and so it didn't matter that infrastructure was, was okay. It was more of the context of the neighborhood, the security issues around the neighborhood, the appropriation of those spaces um, that was lacking. So it, it, it wouldn't be on just providing infrastructure. And so at the beginning with the, with the consulting team and the city team, they were really bummed out because they were saying, well, the safety pin index comes out great and then we're getting this different results from the participatory mapping in a, and because they're geo-reference, we knew which corner we were getting different results. Um, and then, you know, with a change of mindset and saying it's not that they're contradictory is that they're telling you a different story. One is telling you infrastructure, pure infrastructure, what, what's being done and intervene. It's like the 80-20 rule. Infrastructure is 80%, 20% is really, or, or 
the, the inverse, right? 20% is infrastructure and 80% is really the appropriation of those spaces, the context, the geographical context of being in an isolated, impoverished neighborhood uh, with, you know, train tracks on one side and huge, uh, you know, green private spaces like country clubs and, you know, and, and other spaces, you're locked in your neighborhood. And so it doesn't matter how good and shiny your sidewalk is um, if you're not uh, getting to all these other more social issues that we tend to ignore in the transport sector because that's, that's a, the, the reality of it, right? The public, the activation of public spaces or everything else that we try to work around doesn't fit with the modeling of tr transport systems that we, you know, we usually hear from um, our transport specialists and engineers. So it was, it was a really good example. It's, it's something that we like to showcase more, how the social sciences have to stay with us, how with, in the days of chat GTP that we were discussing uh, uh, earlier, it's really easy to go to data, go to digital tools, think that it's a silver lining, but gender is still complex. It's super contextual. It it just it's it's including the the title of the of the panel that I thought it was very provocative. Lena, by the way, it was great because it's it's mapping danger. We usually consider perception of security, and the perception of security puts back into me, into my individual self, how, like it's in a subjective thing, how I perceive security. Mapping danger is something else. It's telling everybody objectively where the danger is. And so I think it, it's semantics, but it's important to differentiate the two, and it's important to differentiate the different tools that you have to collect those two issues. And I think that's what just Kalpana was saying, we have to, we, we already have data. We have to go beyond the data and understand what type of collection methods work for different things, how they can complement each other, and at the end, what do we want to find out? In this case, we did not need data to understand where to intervene because the intervention was already done. But it's to understand what else can be done besides pavement and lighting, right? So I think um, that's that's um, the message that that I wanted to get across with with the example. Thank you so much, Angie. And I think um, needing multiple data sets. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Please. Sorry, disrupting this panel, but doing it in a... <laughs> I just really want to bounce off that because you've given a two really fantastic things and from Bogota about the women's experience. And we had a very similar thing in Ireland. And, and this is where I want to draw the same, same, but different thing all the time because it is all same, same, but different. You know, people will always find reasons to be unique and therefore deter action. But there's so much we can learn from same, same. And in Ireland, we got invited to use our app to measure women's experience so we were crowdsourcing, but targeted crowdsourcing, and so a bit like participative. And it was a beautifully engineered trans system. And that stops were in the perfect position so that the traffic could flow as freely as it possibly could. And the system ran down the street. You know, like they, it was beautifully engineered. And women didn't like it and didn't use it because when they got off the stops, they were scared because they had to get off mid-block and there were no escape routes down that. Like some really basic principles about designing safe spaces had been lost in this perfectly transport engineered system, exactly as, as you're saying. And I just wanted to bring a comment that I, um, to pick up on your last point, I just think is a really important one. And the point about data and the point about these apps is that they enable us to translate um, from making harassment a personal problem that needs a personal solution to making it a societal problem that needs a societal solution and that translation of the individual into the systemic change that we want. That's what the apps, that's what the data, that's what the process allows us to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Right. No, no. <laughs> we're like hijacking the whole session. Um, yeah, we're like, bye. Uh, no, but to, to, to go back to that, and actually that's what Safety Pin is so, like it's been so helpful for us. The, the director of, of the, the um, Housing Institute in Buenos Aires said, we already knew this, but you put it into a paper with data in a map, and that helps me in the internal negotiation, right? So it's it's not that we're discovering you know, something that 
we as women do not know. Of course, there's nuances, but to have put it in, to systematize and put it in quantitative terms that a lot of people and a lot of specialists understand puts you in the map. It's not like, oh, those social sciences or the, that, that focus group that you did once. No, it's in a paper and it's in a map. It has a, you know, location, it's like a number. And so it's, it's really, that's, I think that's been the key to putting these things in, a, in the agenda of the public sector. Okay, thank you. I think all the examples that have been given shows how we can get government to uptake some of this data and use it to inform planning, decisions, investment. And that's really where we can translate everything that we do here. That's what we, our end goal is to see that into action on the ground, changing lives uh, for, for women. So I'm gonna pause here once because I really want to hear from the audience. So um, if you have any questions, we have a bunch of backup questions ready so we can continue uh, the discussion. But if there's any questions that you have for the panelists, um, let me take one or two and then we can get back to the discussion. Yes. Thank you for this very insightful, uh, it's not an introduction, but uh, you know what I mean. Uh, I, sorry? Art, it's very well articulated. <laughs> uh, we are doing a lot of work on transport data in the Asian Transport Outlook. It struck me that you were talking mostly about the urban level, and I did not hear any references to national. Like, why is that? <laughs> Let's keep the question simple. <laughs> I think it was more our briefing for the panel in terms of focusing on street level experience for women and, and that type of thing. So it was more the focus for the panel. But, but, it's, yeah. but if you expand a little bit on it, like if you would say like, if we would want to look at uh, gender specific data at the national level, like some reflections on that? There's a big spot, and he's looking straight at me. <laughs> no, no, I'm no, no, actually, you are, you are. No, but to, to pick it up, because we're working on national policies at the moment around walking and cycling, and we're looking and analysing all of those in terms of their levels of commitment. And this, we don't do it at gender. Maybe you have some experiences on the gender dimension. We're looking at it more from walkability. And, and where they see this street-level female experience doesn't translate into those policies at that level at the moment. Um, but it's not saying whether it should or not. I think it's um, it's it is important, and I think say for in India we have the we have many levels of data. So there's a city. I'm, I'm not going below that. There's also the state, where a lot of um, data gets collected, and then you have the national, where you have um, your census data, you have the national family health survey, you have the national NSSO data, and um, I think it's um, you know. We have certainly found that on unpacking some of the gender elements of, um, of a whole range of things, the national data um, has much greater impact because you're able to sort of show something very clearly. So for example, the last census was the first time that we collect in India, we collected gender disaggregated data on transport. So we had fantastic data about women walking to work, you know, not using bicycles, how many, what percentage of men. And it was not obvious simply because since the, our priority has been to move cars, the fact that there's, it's only less than 20% of Indians who use cars, but then even 20% of Indians is a lot of people. <laughs> so the roads get clogged and you have, um, uh, the cars as the main problem. So you, all transport planning tended to continue f working only around how do you end the traffic jams. And I think the data at the national level bringing out some of these things was extremely valuable for, um, even for us working at the city level or even at the, uh, you know, even more micro levels. But the other problem with that is that national data tends to collect only journey to work and that's, only journey to work, the commute. They only ask one question in these national census, which loses most trips by, by women. So it is, it is a gender gap. In, in that sense, I think 
there's a lot of data already being collected at the national level that is not being recognized as gender data. And so it's, for example, time usage data. You can have so much insight from those type of surveys in terms of mobility of care, in terms of what you, you know, just brown and mentioned on, on just focusing on commute. When you see that most women um, spend their time doing care activities, it, and, and you see that at the national level, you can tell that transport planning is completely, it's not, uh, it's not being done according to the data. You're focusing on that 20% <laughs> um, that is really commuting to work. And so I think it, we have to have sort of like a, a keener eye and, and put that gender lens in observing already all the data collection that is going on at the national level and just understanding the, the, the context of, of gender roles and gender norms to analyze them with a different lens because the data is already there at the national level, which is not the case at the city level. So I think we have that opportunity there that it's not being properly um, looked after. Uh, I think we have one, yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to reflect a little bit about something that two of you said which is um, that when you went to the local government and presented the data, they kind of doubted it. Or like they said, only because we have this data, then we can act. While um, it's something that we all knew and women already knew, right? So I want to go out of the uh, data topic and go back to the representation topic. Because if we had more, more women sitting on the table, no one would, ha would have doubted the first data set that you presented, right? Because if we had women sitting on the table, we would have people who would have already felt that feeling of unsafety or, or something like that. So yeah, so I, I just listened to you and I questioned myself about how much do we need to prove ourselves to be credible, right? So I just wanted to mention that, that came to my mind and I think it's something important to, to mention. Yeah, I'll give you an example of how important it is to have women in those decision-making roles so that when the data lands, there's somebody to act on it, just you know, like, like we've been talking about. Um, when we did this project work in Dublin, we did it because the report that revealed the travel habits of women in Ireland was commissioned by a woman at the head of the agency because she'd gone to a, a session like this and thought we know nothing about women in Ireland. When we went out and did the work on street and we went back to report to the local authority and to the national agency that had commissioned the report and had the money to make the changes on street, only women turned up to listen to those to those, the result. In fact, in the first scheduled meeting, nobody turned up from the local authority who was actually going to implement the changes. And the only people who came from the national authority were the um, were women. And the same in the Barcelona when we did the report with the Inclusify project and we looked into all around the women and public transport. The only people who turned up to listen to the results were women inside those agencies. So it's very real still the need for getting those women into positions that can have the the authority to not only ask for the research, but to receive the results and to act on it and then to find another woman in, in where who's got the money to actually uh, bring the money to the to the table. It does still need that um, in the in the dynamic. And we, I think you see it, you see it. We've talked about it when we were preparing. It's everywhere still that dynamic, yeah. Add one point to that, there is the gender dimension and then there is, um, you know, what we find is that women living in the peripheries, in informal settlements, their voices are, and their concerns are even less heard. I mean, probably even men in those areas. But I think the, the diversity that we need to bring to the table, and I think the point that Bronwyn said right up front, is that we also, while there is a certain level of, um, as women, there's something we can all identify with. But I think different women face the city very differently. And we know that, for example, I'll tell you a very small example. We were doing safety audits 20 years ago in Delhi. We have these apartment buildings where there's security guards. But the security guards, the women who lived in the building felt safer 
But the domestic workers who came to work in the building did feel safer because these people are only bothered about people who lived in the building. So, you know, I think we need to um, interrogate ourselves that, you know, um, sometimes the gender lens must not uh, overtake other inequalities and other um, discriminations, which also cause tremendous, uh, um, I think, disempowerment, and we're not, they're not at the table to speak. So I think as women, since we have faced um, so much of uh, discrimination, what we should always be aware when we speak that to never forget that, that element of it. Otherwise, it will just become one discourse replacing another discourse. Okay. Thank you. So I have, I have three questions for you, but we only have about eight minutes, so um, <laughs> we'll try to, to get through this quite quickly. Um, so Angie, um, development banks invest huge amounts of finances in transport. And earlier we were talking about how do you make walking and cycling bankable? How do you make gender bankable? Are these even questions that we need to be asking, right? Um, but um, because development banks invest huge amounts in infrastructure and operations, and this can significantly influence how streets are being designed and built for women, what effective strategies is CAF doing in this area? And what can development banks in general do to incorporate, streamline, transform gender inclusion um, and include uh, in mobility? That's a really hard question. <laughs> Even though I was prepared for it, I, I still don't know how to answer. Um, to tell you the truth, everything that it's very, we have to base our work um, in the political will of the municipalities that we work with, right? And, and in that leadership that you mentioned and in the representation. And so we can, I can't say, at least not, I mean, formally, that we have a strategy for that because it's very, country by country, city by city uh, based. But what we can do is start putting these things into, into the agenda. And, and by understanding what data we're supposed to, to, to collect, to put forward um, that these interventions, because they have agenda lens, don't mean that they cost more doesn't mean that you know, they take up more time or more space, that it's, it's a tweak within the science, it's, understand, it's putting one more check in terms of understanding how infrastructure is being used or how public system are, are being used. And because I think it does, it does when you do speak to um, a particular ally, a city, um, or you know, someone who's going to implement our project, immediately they think, how much is this gonna cost me? How much more? How much more time? Because I need to, you know, cut the ribbon in one year of whatever I'm building, and so I think one of the things that that as development agencies we can do is to to put forward that information that it's it doesn't it's not going to cost you any more time more more money, and actually you're probably going to get more benefits in terms of impact or accessibility or, or you know cost uh, or healthcare uh, costs that you're gonna be saving or, um, so we have to, I think, make more visible the state. I, I hate it because of, of your point as well, that we have to prove ourselves, we have to prove that this is the right thing to do over and over and over. Um, I was uh, I was asked, I'm, I forgot the organization, but it was a big international organization to, to do a review on a paper they were doing on all the savings that the cities and the governments were going to have if they include the gender perspective. And it was, it was like the premise of it. It was like, why do I need to justify that I'm important in your planning just because I'm going to, if you do, it's going to cost you less, right? And so, but this, these are still things that are going around. And as long as we don't have representation, money is what's going to move all these projects. And so perhaps a short term not sustainable solution, but a short-term solution is this, is to showcase that this is not the huge investment that you know, people believe it could be. Um, that's a way that we do it and that it has worked uh, to just make sure that they understand that this is not going to entail more time or more money. That is something that you have to do, but it's not going to um, interrupt their cycle, if you will. Um, I, I think that's a very um, useful and tangible uh, next step um, that many development agencies can, can take and um, a lot of organizations that are working in this area. Um, so another sort of um, very important mode of transport is walking. Um, and in many of our cities, 
<laughs> this is often overlooked. And I say that because everybody sort of assumes it, it'll take care of itself, right? Like walking will take care of itself, we're gonna invest in other areas. Um, but it's the dominant form of transport and we're all pedestrians at one point. Um, so because this is very central to this conversation, Bronwyn, how can we utilize gender data in a city to ensure better provision for women and girls? Yeah, it's also not an easy question to answer. Despite <laughs> yeah, I'm keeping the, all the hard ones. The heads up. <laughs> it's interesting, actually, a, a small reflection, but I find sometimes asking, uh, uh, negotiating, asking, campaigning for walkability has a similar tone to this, to what you've said about gender. It's not going to cost you more. It is going to benefit. Have to justify the very basic mode of transport that we all need. You know, like a public transport system's customer base is people right, that walk to the station in the vast majority of cases. Yes, we can imagine some of them come by cars, but not in the vast majority of cases. But we don't invest in the walkable catchments to bring those people to it. And yet the research shows that if we do invest in that walkability to that station, then we get higher ridership, which underpins the fiscal viability of the public transport system. We've squared that circle. It's not costing you more. It's just a standard line in your in in investment pattern. And, and one of the interesting things um, when you, I, I learned from Sweden, beautiful study where they actually asked girls what they wanted in their local parks because girls weren't hanging around in their local parks. And it wasn't because of the boys being there or anything else. It's because they had nowhere to sit. And as much as we don't want teenage girls to lose their levels of activity, the reality is that they do want to sit. And they, they didn't put in swings where they swang individually, they put in swings where they could sit and swing together, and girls occupy the public space. It's not about spending more money, it's just about spending the money we have differently to achieve a, a better outcome. And so with walking and walkability, the gender data helps us to do that because when we want to argue um, about where cities should be placing their investment, you'll all know about 15-minute cities, okay? It gets a little bit of traction with the <laughs> right wing nowadays as something else to, to campaign against. So you know you're doing the right thing if you've upset them. And the thing about a 15-minute city, and I want to use this to illustrate this really uh, just as a final point. The World Bank did a study in Buenos Aires in 2014 and found out that men and women spend 47 minutes each commuting every morning. KPI, 47 minutes, equal travel time. Oh, there we go, there's equality. Men spend that traveling in a straight line in a motorized vehicle, and so they go further to a workplace destination in a motorized fashion. Women spend that 47 minutes moving within their local community, delivering children, doing shopping, doing care work. They do the same amount of time, but in a completely different travel pattern. And so once we understand that travel pattern, the reason this matters so much is not the 47 minutes, which is the KPI for transport investment, time savings, it's so old fashioned. We, have, we know that's another conversation. But what we have to then inform is, well, what decision do we make? Because if the perception, the interpretation of that study says that to give women more access to economic opportunities, we have to enable them to travel further the same way that, that men travel further. Or we co-locate those economic opportunities with where women and in walkable communities and invest in those local, local neighborhoods. So the simple data, simple numbers, we have to embrace the complexity. And I think it was earlier today that someone said politicians don't like complex, and this is, oh no, it was in a meeting this morning I was at, and you know, politicians don't like complex, you know, transport is complex, but we have to embrace some of that complexity because that's the way women live their lives, and that's one of the challenges that we have. So I think we, we have to bring the data, we have to bring the conversation, but that to me is where this all joins up in this idea of localizing services. And if that's an anti-capitalist agenda, that's another conversation as well. But just valuing that localized investment, valuing the smaller scale, and I know development banks don't get out of bed for less than billion dollar projects. People have been telling me this for years when I ask them why they don't invest in walking. We have to find ways to make it meaningful at scales that they can that they can invest in and cities can value and it's not all big bridges and tickets to ribbons to cut. That brings me to the perfect segue in the last question about how we can scale. Um, and I think earlier Sonal was telling us that um, you know really at this point we have the tools, we have 
you know, we're starting to collect some of this data. How can we get to scale? I mean, this is um, something that I'm really um, very emotionally invested now. You know, after spending so many years working on this, I want to see the change in my lifetime. <laughs> I, mean, I don't want to wait another 50 years to see the change. I mean, honestly, when I started working in, in this, you know, 35 years ago, so now you know how old I am, um, I never thought that my daughter would actually face the same problems that I did, uh, navigating public spaces. And, you know, that itself was a bit um, sad. So I think we have data. We have many, many good practices. We have um, the understanding of the complexity. We have more diversity in government. We have, you know, uh, banks like CAF who have someone like Angie who sees the complexity. We have academics who are writing about it. We have the Asian Transport Outlook, which has so many uh, data points. We, I think we have everything in place. And um, I, I do believe, uh, and at least in India, and I think that's why Sonal said it, is that Everyone wants to do a pilot, you know, and they don't want to expand. And, you know, in such a big country, um, it's not enough to help one small community. We have to scale. Solutions have to have scales. And if we look at the big cities today, they are in Asia and they are going to be in Africa, right? I think we also need to recognize that we don't really want such big cities. And the point is that because they will never be really sustainable, you know. Uh, and I think um, the models that, and the model that we can learn from is not going to be European cities. And I'm going to say this, and I think this is something that I've said very often, that when someone in India puts up this lovely bicycle road in Denmark and says, why can't we have this? And I'm like, there is a whole history why we are here today. And a lot of it is because you know, people in all these countries, colonialism. I mean, there's a history that we can, it's not that long ago, colonialism, you know. It's, it's in our lifetime, most many of us. So I think, no, not in my lifetime. Okay, I'm not that old. <laughs> <laughs> my parents. <laughs> <laughs> but it, 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 it's, it's still very um, raw, you know. And I think that we when we plan our cities, we have to look at new models. I mean, the model of the moving the car faster, it didn't work in the United States, it didn't work in Europe, it is not working for us across Asia, Africa, Latin America. So let's not have to go from A to B to C to find out that A and B were both wrong. We can't be here at C and look at some options, uh, like um, the, mayor, the deputy mayor of Tirana said, they didn't have uh, flyovers. So why build the flyovers? So I think we we may have to do some leapfrogging. We have to do some really innovative thinking out of the box. We have to be willing to be different. We have to do innovative ways of data collection. And we have to work together. I mean, really, I think to me, more and more, I'm beginning to realize that if you're here to make your own um, little, you know, um, mark, it's not gonna change things enough. You have to be willing to work together because the problem is so big, but we cannot wait too much to have change. So I think, you know, and I, I, I think in the five years between we started this and now, there's so many more conversations. At ITF, there's so many gender sessions. I mean, release this and that. On the first ITF, there was no session on gender. There was only the first day. So I think we also have to sometimes also feel a little happy that things have moved because sometimes we tend to be really negative about not, nothing has moved. So, you know, I think on that note, um, I will end with a little positivity. <laughs> okay, thank you to all the panelists today. I think uh, we all learned something very interesting from all of your work um, and we're leaving with very tangible outputs um, of, of how we can bring that change. So if we can give a round of applause to our panelists. And thank you everyone.